start off talking mostly about the equipment just to get everyone started. Um, so as a brief intro for archery, I'm sure you all already know this, but you know, you use a bow and an arrow, right? Um, in particular, each of these is made up of their own separate parts. So for an arrow, you're going to have a knock. These bits here are called the fletchings or the feathers or veins. And then you have the shaft, which is the long section, and then the head and the draw stop. What each of these do, um, going back to the beginning in the back, so the knock here is where you put it onto the bow, right? So it attaches like that, right? The knock helps it keep in place, make sure that you can actually shoot it and if the string doesn't fly off in a random direction. Um, the veins make it so that while the arrow is flying, if you mess up at all in any way, it will redirect it so that it points in the direction that it is flying. The shaft is honestly the main part of the arrow. Um, head, I don't think I really need to explain that. Uh, the draw stop is something that we include specifically in Belgar so that, that way you don't pull the arrow back too far. Um, which I will go over a bit later into what each of those needs to be for safety. Um, but moving on to the bow. The bow itself can be made up of typically about four-ish parts. I say ish because that can vary tremendously. Um, but in particular, you're going to have your main body, which will consist of a handle and the flexible parts, which are called the limbs. And then you will have a string that runs from the, runs from the end of one limb to another, with you know, it functioning by pulling back on the string. So any questions about that? The summary of the parts. Okay, now going into the safety bits. So first off is an arrow. Your arrow needs to be complete. And what is considered to be complete is first off your knock has to actually be intact. I have seen arrows on fields that have broken knocks where parts of it will be missing so it cannot stay on the string. I have seen knocks that can attach to each other with one sticking on the back of the other, which would also not be okay. Basically your knock has to actually be functional. If it is not functional, it is not safe and you cannot keep using the arrow. Next. The fletchings or veins, you have to have at least two of them on the arrow that are intact. If you have two of them and they're both split in half, it is not okay. If you have only one of them, it is not okay. Typically, they will start out with three or four, but that can change as they, you know, are flying across a bow or getting stepped on by a bunch of people, etc. If there are less, if there are less than two whole ones, it cannot be used. For the shaft. There's a whole process to check if the shaft is safe. Essentially, what you're going to be looking for is any cracks or bends, depending on the material. Um, and there are ways to check the internals, which I'm not going to go over today because that's more of an advanced bit. Um, draw stop. The draw stop needs to be at 28 inches from where the knock knocks onto the string. This is because you, if you pull back farther than that, if someone has a max weight bow, they will then go beyond the max amount of energy we will be allowed to be in an arrow, which means that things can start to get unsafe when people are pulling back too far. Um, for the head, there's a whole lot about the, con the construction that I don't have memorized, but it, essentially it needs to be squishy front end and the inside of it needs to have a penny in order to stop the shaft from poking through and you need to not be able to feel the penny when you're squishing on the front. So any questions about the safety bits for an arrow for what you can kind of look for immediately? Yep. That's good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what was wrong with that one? Oh, it has cracks. <laughs> How did Which, you feel that? Uh, well, I was kind of pressing on it and I could hear it while I was pressing on it. So, <laughs> so this one's done. Um, there we go. Uh, so any questions about checking the arrows? And what you can do for a quick check. We're not going to go over an in-depth safety check on the arrows today. This is just for quick checks. Yes. Uh, for the arrows, can you do modular arrows with removable heads? Yes, you can. However, while you are using them, they have to be secured in place. Um, part of the safety check process is actually making sure that both it doesn't come off easily before shooting. And then we actually shoot them once or twice and then check them again to make sure that they haven't loosened up afterwards. Yes. So here's a question. It relates to the arrow you found that was a little cracked. Yes. So what are other ways you can find out that it was cracked without like hearing it? Um, honestly, you really just have to look at it and run your hand down it. Um, in that case, I was squeezing on it and it was literally, I could hear the cracks while that was happening. But you can look at it. I mean, I can... Right? 
typically when there is actually a crack, you can see it. Oh yeah, that's very visible. Let me see that. Right? Uh, but sometimes you can't. There are ways to listen to the inside of the arrow. Um, but that's honestly something that you'll want to practice with arrows that are already broken. You want to know what it sounds like, and then you can listen for it. Um, and again, we will not be covering that today. Yes? If an arrow is short enough, does it require a draw stop? No. Um, if the base of the head makes it so that there is less than 28 inches, this being an example, if there's less than 28 inches between the knock and the base of the head, you do not need a draw stop because the base of the head functions as a draw stop. Yes. What if it was exactly 28 inches? Same thing. As long as it gets to 28 inches or less, you are fine. Typically speaking, though, they're going to measure it, and if, for example, they're using a measurement tape that's slightly stretched and therefore or compressed in some way, and then they measure it to be longer than 28 inches, you could end up running into trouble. So my recommendation is try to get it under 28 inches just to be on the safe side. If you're trying to avoid using a draw stop. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, so next is checking the bow. Um, same sort of thing before you're gonna be looking for cracks. In this case, because it is covered in a leather layer, you're not gonna see any cracks on something like this. Um, but you know, you're going to be looking for how frayed is the string? Does it look like it's going to come apart in two seconds after somebody shoots it? Um, are there any cracks in, this parts, in the parts that are visible? Um, is the string able to be properly secured? Uh, the other thing is it needs to be able to check the weight. Uh, so we can use one of these tools, which is, what's it called, like a fish hook? Um, basically what it does is it hooks onto the string, you pull it back, and it measures the draw weight. So you use an arrow to make sure you're pulling back the right distance, and it measures the weight, and it needs to be 35 pounds maximum at 28 inches. Um, yes. So would you be able to demonstrate that? Yeah. Do one more check. As a general rule, if you are pulling back on the string and you don't want to shoot someone, don't point it at them. Consider it a firearm. Um, and this applies to both safe and non-safe arrows just because, you know, some people don't want to get shot. Um, right, so I pull it back right to the draw stop, and then I let down, and we're looking at about 34 pounds. Uh, oops, that did not turn off. Well, whatever, I'll leave it. Um, so any other questions about the bow and the basics of this safety checking the bow? We have a somewhat facetious question that you can let me know if you're getting to later on. What are the consequences of unsafe equipment entering into the field? Uh, being removed from the field? No, I mean the consequences for other players. Like what, what happened if the bow was in the field that was not up to scale? Uh, well, the person shooting it could get heavily injured. Um, if anyone is standing next to them, when it shatters, they could get heavily injured. Um, in the case of an arrow, you know, those are flying around. People are usually using other people's arrows. If your arrow falls apart on somebody else's bow, then that can cause a problem. Uh, at Siege, arrows were taken off of the field because someone had their modular head come off of their shaft during the second scenario one of the days. Um, and they decided just to take arrows off the field the rest of the day. Yes. Um, put that in perspective if you don't mind um i want like you know we we fight with with foamed weapons all the time um we're talking about 35 pounds of force and when you have an arrow that has a modular head like that you have a, advantages of even the modular head creating air resistance to slow down the speed take all that away and put a point on the end like what's going to happen to the other person on the other end of that you know you're going to at the minimum you know hurt them badly at maximum penetrate their skin and potentially cause a lethal injury just for reference and you also had a hand up yes are there any limits to what a bow can be made of as long as it follows and keeps to the safety standards uh so you're not allowed to use compound bows and you have to it can't be too modern that's going to honestly vary by the event that you're at um but typically speaking it is better if it looks in period it doesn't have to like for example you notice the recurves that we have here do not really look in period but you know they have no real obvious symbols on them they are still relatively normal bows there's no holes in the 
uh, riser, which is the handle section. Um, you know, things like that. I've seen some bows made of uh, PVC piping that are re-secured yep. and then dressed up to look more um, fantasy, but usually follow the same poundage and weight limits they usually pass at the larger, bigger events. Just wanted to make sure, me being a cross game, that it's still acceptable here. Uh, yes and no. The biggest point is that you have to be careful about the kinds of things that are added on. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that they're going to check is, you know, how securely is it added on? If someone shoots 10 times and things start loosening up, they may say that the bow's not allowed because they're afraid something could fly off of it. Um, or, you know, if it's kind of a sharper piece, they may just say no anyway, because if you're shooting and, and you don't notice someone walking up beside you and they get hit by the shat, by the part of the bow, mm -hmm. like the limbs, no thanks. <laughs> it just follows rule zero at that exactly. point. Exactly. Yeah. Any other questions about the bow? Yes. Okay, so this is a quick question combat-wise. Okay. Like, let's say somebody's coming in with a sword to attack you. Would you be able to defend with the bow, or is it better to just try to step out of the way? So, a lot of that will be covered later, um, but first and foremost, whenever someone is within 20 feet of you, you're not allowed to pull it back all the way. You have to do something called half draw, um, which is again something that we'll be covering later. Um, the other thing is that the arrow itself doesn't even count if it has not been able to fully leave the bow, right? So, if they get closer than this to me, I cannot shoot them at all, because the arrow has to leave the bow. Um, at that point, it's up to personal preference. You can pull out a sidearm, you can run away, you can take two steps to stand behind the shieldsman that happens to be standing near you to guard your back. Um, or you can take dead. It's personal preference. Yes. If I can just add something, you can't stab them with the bow, though. Oh, I'm yes. You cannot stab with the arrow. You definitely can't stab with the arrow. I was still questioning the arrow. Projectile arrow. Yeah, yeah. I can't take the arrow off and shove it into somebody's gut. I have to have, like, a legally, like, blue, green, class one, and class three weapon. Yeah. To clarify, this is a projectile weapon. This is not a legal dagger or spear. <laughs> yeah. Unlike a javelin where you are allowed to use both, this is not a javelin. Yeah. And we'll get just in case you're you're going to cover it later, so if so, sorry, but are you going to go over dry shooting? Is that what's called? Dry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that'll be a lot of those will be part of safety usage of the bow. Cool. Right now, it's just covering the actual equipment. Cool. Yes. Do you use crossbows or? Crossbows are allowed, but they have a different set of rules oh. regarding what's allowed. There's like a whole chart that regards measuring the foot pounds. I do not know this because I have not used a crossbow. Uh, that being said, there are people who sell usable crossbows that are specifically designed to fall within the safety okay. parameters of the game, so you can find those. We have some of those links on our Discord. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I have a guy that's really close to me that has um, like expanded upon the use of crossbows and bow darts. Uh, if you want to use one of those, message me. I'll give you some tips. I don't know the exact, but uh, yes. I'm just yes. Any other questions? Okay, now we're going to move into some other equipment that's being used that is not necessarily the bow and arrow. First one, this is one that I highly recommend everyone having if they don't have something like it on their string. It is your finger tab. This is designed to protect your fingers. You will notice when you pull it back, you'll put your fingers on the string. What this does is this puts a layer between your fingers and the string so that you don't have to build up calluses for your fingers to stop hurting. Um, on the loner bows that we have, they have a piece on the string already that prevents that. It is plastic. It is specifically designed for the type of shooting that I will be teaching later today. Um, there are other forms of finger protection as well, based on the different style of shooting that you do. But in general, it is highly recommended to have it unless you really want to build those calluses. Next is an arm guard. I have been shooting very little today, and I have been shooting fairly well, and I already have welts building on my arm because I don't like wearing an arm guard. Even if you shoot perfectly, you are still bound to start pitting your arm every once in a while because even a perfect shot will still have the string stop about that close to your arm and vibrate it. It's going to hit against your arm a bunch, so even if it doesn't hurt, it still builds up a welt, and if you mess up at all, it hurts a lot. So arm guards, very, very, very highly recommended. Technically not required, but highly recommended. Um, next, you will not be needing these today. Um, because the bows will make it so you don't need them. But for those who shoot a horse bow type bow, if you do not want your hand that is holding the bow to get hurt, this is a type of glove that will protect the top of your hand. 
this out just to briefly show it. Right, so this way I can have the arrow sit on my hand still and it will protect it. And, and basic safety equipment. Sorry, and that's protecting you from like the arrow touching your hand, the yes, string so, touching your hand, and the fletching touching your hand, right? Yes, so I normally do not use them because for the most part it isn't really necessary with my arrows. However, when I was using Rila's arrows earlier, hers are have very abrasive fletchings and I decided to wear it because it was getting uncomfortable. <laughs> This will get embedded, it, like, it will cause a very bad paper cut. It's yeah. not fun. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> um, for those who eventually decide that they want to own a bow, or for those who have to start setting up a bow if someone is busy but they still want to borrow one, uh, you will want a stringer. This is an example of a stringer. We will go over in a second how to actually use it. Um, yeah, that's oh, I already mentioned it earlier, but measuring hook, very nice for getting your measurements on your bow. It is also good to check them every once in a while, especially if your bow is made of wood, because the material will ultimately start deteriorating, even if it doesn't break, um, so that way you can check the weight. Um, although usually it goes down, not up, but still worth checking. Uh, so any questions about the extra safety gear? Okay. Uh, so now we're going to go into starting off using a bow. First off, you should know how to string it. So can we actually bring up the others so they can be passed around so people can look at them? Yeah, sure. So first off, you're going to want to look at the loops on the end. This is not universal, but it'll be the case about 95% of the time, which is for the two loops that are on the end of the string, one of them will be bigger than the other. That bigger loop is going to be the one that is considered the top of the string, right? When you are going to start, you're going to want to look at your bow. In this case, there is a section that is designed to be fit into a hand, so I can use that to tell. Um, it also has things like this divot here where the arrow would go, so that would be above the hand. So by using that, I can see that in this case, this way it is right side up. You would want to take the bigger loop and have it go partially around the shaft so that it is down. And then the smaller loop will go on to the end of the bottom side to get us started. Now, if you know how to string it without using a stringer, then you can go ahead and do that, but I will not be demonstrating it so that you guys don't try it because I know what I'm doing and I am not teaching that today. Instead, the way that is much safer to prevent your bow from getting damaged during the stringing process is to use the stringer. What you're going to do is now that you have gotten the string part of the way on, the stringer itself is going to have one end that is going to be a tighter cup type space that the end of the limb will fit into, right? So that's going to, once you've gotten the string into place firmly, that will hold it in place as well as attach the bottom limb to the stringer. And then the top of the stringer will wrap around the top limb and you want to pull it past where you've got the string loop so that, that way when you start put, applying pressure it can slide up. You can lower it down, put your feet on it. You're going to raise it up, get the string into place, and then slowly let it down while keeping an eye on both ends to make sure they're in place. There we go. Any questions about stringing the bow? Does anyone want to volunteer to string the other loner bows that have not yet been strung? Um, okay. We actually only have, um, I, I welcome it. We only have the one, oh, from, okay. unfortunately. Well, oh, we, we only had two. one volunteer. So. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, here is, here is um, well, I guess they're both the same, but I have them. Ah, yes. They are the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, you already oh, did that sorry. one. Yeah, I did it when I was watching. Oh, okay. That one's already done as well. So we have more loners. We just don't have any unstrung ones. In theory, we could unstring them. Yeah, we can just unstring them, them, yeah, them yeah, if yeah, other people want to. Shoot, you know, they, James is already unstringing this one. <laughs> but that one's not a loner. Oh, I don't care if people use it. Okay. It's fine. It's a loner. <laughs> Today, it's a loner.
Okay. Oh, hold on. So one thing that I'm noticing is that it's kind of twisting around. Oh. So when you're setting it up, you want to make sure that it is all on the side that you're pulling it from. And then the bottom, you want to see a little divot there. Mm -hmm. There's also one that on the top as well. But oh, the on the top? Yeah. So those are there to make sure that the string stays in place and lines up. All right, so I recommend having one of your hands on the handle part. And you might want to have this actually slid down just a bit further. No, nope, this way. There we go. And then you're going to pull up there, and you're going to push on this end here. Yep, so that it slides and you want to get it onto there. Keep pulling, keep pulling, so it's not, it's not securely on. questions about stringing the bow? Um, so I've seen people use their feet and hook it in a way to string it. That's typically how I've done it. Why is this better? So the main thing is that when you are doing that, it is very hard to ensure that you are flexing it in a straight line in the same way that the string does. And when I say it, I mean the limbs. Um, in particular, you want this plane to not get warped in any way. When you try to string it using any other method that does not involve a stringer, there is a very high possibility that you'll accidentally twist the limbs and cause them to be warped, which will make, means that they will deteriorate a lot faster. Now that being said, these are also plastic, so they are a lot less likely to warp even if you do that. Um, but general rule of thumb is you, your bow will last longer if you actually use a stringer to string it. Cool, thank you. And to unstring it. Right. Any other questions? I've got more of a general question. Yes. How many people, like, in this, do, do people typically specialize in bow and arrow? Do people kind of sometimes do melee, sometimes do bow and arrow? Is it there is both. Uh, I personally consider myself to specialize in bow and arrow. However, we a lot of the time we don't have enough people that practice for it to really be useful, or we're running a specific scenario that doesn't allow for it, in which case I have to use something else. So ultimately, I end up using more other weapons than I do bow and arrow. There are other people who are like Kai over here, who honestly, he's better with his sword than he is with his bow, although he is also good with his bow. But he will do things like, you know, shoot a couple of arrows and then pull out his sword. I apologize for calling you out. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a good question to ask. Very good question. So, so it's good to know both styles, because yep. for different scenarios and stuff, you may need to know. Yep. I mean, I mean a, a big... A big thing in this game is that you don't have infinite arrows. Uh, at some point, you will need to retrieve or get on the front line or, or assist in some other way if you run out of uh, arrows. So just sticking to ranged weapons, you it, it is possible, but um, there are plenty of scenarios that uh, like a, some sort of swordsmanship skill will come into play. Or if somebody likes to run at you. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is well. That is that well. Is people, people will will charge you. Big stick. <laughs> yes. Is there any benefit to unstringing your bow? Uh, yes and no. Uh, ultimately, it technically depends on the material. Plastic bows can actually stay strong for longer periods of time. Um, but what ends up happening is while you have it strung, there is energy stored in this. And for a material that is likely to start degrading, that means that it'll start by the energy will make it get degrade faster. That applies technically to plastic as well, but they degrade so slowly anyway that they're likely to break in a different way first. Um, in the case of wood, because they are affected by things like temperature as well and humidity, 
uh, what ends up happening is they can actually adjust their internal structure while they are strung, which means that, you know, say, let's say it starts absorbing water and then it loses some of the water. When it absorbs water, it becomes soft and it actually starts to permanently take on the bent shape, which means that it's going to lose some of its draw weight. Cool. Good to know that. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, let's so couple safe uses bit. Um, I talked about it earlier, uh, but just to repeat a few different things. First off, when you are shooting at people, just to point it in an area where there aren't people, this is considered full draw. This is approximately half draw. Half draw is not actually fully defined. The general rule of thumb is if you have it down here and you don't, and you're pulling it up to your body, that's basically where your half draw is going to be, even if you're up here. Um, Again, not specifically defined, but just to explain those. Um, when it comes to full draw versus half draw, if someone is within 20 feet of you, you are not the arrow will not count as hitting them if you pull it past half draw. It is technically not allowed. So, uh, to get a rough idea of the distance, about this distance between me and Kai is about 20 feet. If you're not sure, shoot at half draw. Most of the time you don't actually need to go full draw unless someone is standing really far away. And you can tell if you actually need the full draw. Um, as was mentioned earlier, when someone starts getting really close, because this is a projectile weapon, it has to travel the full distance of the arrow from the bow prior to it counting as having left the bow. I.e., if someone is standing right in front of me, like this, I can't shoot him, he is too close. If he is... About that distance away, in theory I could still shoot him. I would have to half draw it, but in theory if the arrow hits him from this distance it would still count. Lastly, as has been mentioned by someone, never dry fire a bow. To define it, dry firing is when you shoot the bow without any arrow on it at all. If it can be avoided, avoid it. There should never actually be a reason to dry fire a bow if you are not in the factory making the bow and testing the physical limits of the bow. Any questions? Yeah. What, what's, what happens when you dry fire? What's the problem? Okay, so... To, there isn't really a simple way to explain this, but okay. I will try to as best as I can. Um, which is, when you shoot, normally you have an arrow on the bow and that arrow goes <laughs> flying away. Right? In order for that to happen, the energy has to get transferred from the string to the arrow, and then it goes. When you're dry firing, there's no arrow to take that energy. So all of that energy that would have gone to the arrow instead goes into the bow itself, which means that, let's say normally when you shoot it, there's still a bit of excess energy that goes. It's about the equivalent of shooting your bow about a thousand extra times. Now, to be fair, in the factory, they will actually intentionally dry fire their bows to make sure that they are functional. But that's in the factory, when they're actually testing them, where if something explodes in somebody's hands, no one cares, because it's not in somebody's hands, it's on a machine. Here, if you dry fire and there's any sort of defect in the limb that has built up from it sitting in your car and getting banged around and getting smashed by a red three times, <laughs> it could explode in your hands and then there can be shards of plastic flying everywhere and we don't want that. Right? If it breaks when you shoot an arrow, there's less energy going into it, and so it's not it's much less likely to hurt someone. If it breaks without an arrow, then there, all of that energy just goes into the explosion, although there isn't any flames. Yes? Would you say that using a crossbow as a sidearm would be a beneficial use because of the size of the arrow and how far it has to travel, allowing it to be shot at closer distances? Um, the difference between the distance is honestly negligible. That being said, there are people who do use crossbows as sidearms, and they are very effective at doing so. If, if I may, um, the, the reason why crossbows are generally more effective as a sidearm is strictly their size. Like, I can, I can, you know, I cowboy style pistol draw with a crossbow, where with this I need two hands, right? So, and I can do that while I have a blue in my other hand, which is what I've seen most people. They'll have a buckler on the arm with a crossbow, they'll shoot the crossbow, they have a sword in their hand. So I have seen, I've seen people do that as well. Okay, any other 
questions about safely shooting a bow and what they're looking at. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think about what my next step is. <laughs> um, yes. What are the rules of getting shot? Ah, okay. So, first off, you have the it has to be a legal shot per what I had just talked about earlier. Um, second off, it has to hit off of you and deflect, what was it, 30? 30 degrees. 30 degrees. Um, so about that-ish much. Um, again, it has to actually deflect off you, so there are plenty of cases where I've hit people with very baggy pants and it, they'll say guard because we only hit their pants and not them. Um, the other thing is arrows do not go through shields or helmets, so if someone is wearing any kind of helmet, then their face is fine. They may still get hit in the face, but it doesn't count. <laughs> I'll, I'll add to that for those of you, because I know we have a lot of people here. Headshots with projectiles are legal. Yes. Only, only projectiles. Yeah. Only, only projectiles. Only projectiles. That includes That's javelin. a projectile. Yes, yes, however, the javelin has to not be in somebody's hand. And it has to travel a certain distance. That right, so cool. it, fo it follows the same rule as the arrow. It has to travel its length and distance from the person prior to hitting them. If it hits yeah, them, I can't be standing here and just like throw it at you. <laughs> just it has to travel. It has half and full draw, just like okay. but that's a whole different concept. Yeah. Just to yeah. repeat this and also add on to it, uh, more of them is talking about ranged projectiles. That's rocks, javelins, anything that is allowed to be thrown within the rocks, game javelins. must follow that, must travel its, its distance. Uh, now, rocks are easy because they're four inches wide. Right. So I can do it. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Javelin is the only exception where it's allowed to also be used as a melee weapon. But if someone's close enough for it to be used as a melee weapon, you can't throw it. You can't stab somebody in the face with a javelin. It has to be thrown. Am I allowed to block an arrow with a sword? No. Uh, so once an arrow is in flight, um, you are, the only thing that is allowed to intentionally block it, I would say, technically your head, um, <laughs> but more importantly, a shield, uh, or if you stand behind some, you know, existing, let's say, yeah, cover, um, or building. Or okay. um, as soon as a projectile has bounced off of something of any kind, it is considered dead, no matter how much it bounced. Um, in the case of arrows, you are not allowed to block them with weapons. Uh, javelins you can, rocks you can, arrows you can not. Um, this is because we're afraid of someone accidentally hitting it and it's spinning around. Um, so, you know, if it's flying at you, don't actually try to catch it. You can dodge it. That's fine, you can put up a shield to block it, um, but don't, don't deflect it. What if happens you if you can. actually physically catch it? Nope. No, no. That if I can, in a like, shot, who wants that and actually answer that question too? You can't, in the rules as written, you cannot intentionally deflect a arrow with a weapon or your body either. Um, part of that is for the reason the budget, part of that is the realism, like in a real battle, are you slashing an arrow? No, you're dead. Um, so if I go like this and I swat an arrow out of the sky, I am dead. Essentially, uh, now if I if I'm holding my weapon like this, if I've got a pole arm and I'm not paying attention, and it hits my weapon. That's okay. Uh, if it hits a weapon, it does pass through the weapon. So let's say I'm standing up with a sword and board like this. This is my sword hand. An arrow hits. No, don't worry about it. An arrow hits me. Hits my sword like direct on. If I pay attention to that, that's going directly into my chest. So even though I didn't intentionally block it, I'm still dead because the arrow passes through my weapon and hits me. The reason why we have big blunted ends is so we don't actually kill each other, but like for the fantasy of the game, we're doing weapon pass through. A lot of times I'll be holding my spear, the arrow will come in like this, the arrow will hit the shaft of my spear, passes through me, and I'm dead. If an arrow hits arm or leg, is that treated as any other arm or leg hit? Yeah, it's a, it's a stabbing, it is considered a stabbing attack. So in the same way that if a spear or a sword stabs you, it disables it, but it's not considered pointed, right? Same thing with the arrow. So it's a kill to header, header body. Unless it's your header body, in which case, well, a, a disabled header body is a dead header body. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's a bit of Bring a, no a, horse, whatever that uh, An advanced question. Uh, I don't know if you get what you're looking for. 
Uh, say you are in a team battle, so greater than 5v5. Mm -hmm. um, you shoot, you're trying to hit a fighter on uh, the opposite end of the line that you are on, um, and it hits a pole arm in between that. Uh, would the projectile still continue as if it was in flight, or would it not hit? Uh, it Technically, because it hit a weapon, it, it can be considered as having continued going. However, the rule for being able to call a shot is you have to actually be able to see the entire flight between where, between when it left the arrow and when it got deflected and, and where it would have hit. So if you don't have good vision on where it was going to go, then if it accidentally hits someone's pole arm, you cannot actually call a hit. Okay. Right? But if, for example, like, let's say you're standing a bit out of a diagonal, you can see the person that you're aiming at, you take the shot, and the guy next to them swings at one of your guys and their sword blocked it. Right. So you could see where it would have gone, you could see the entire path of it, then you can say, hey, that would have hit you over there. Okay. That being said, all of these ultimately fall under specific rulings by heralds at a given event, so they may very well say no, that would not have hit them because the shield was coming up to block it. Or right. Something like that. Cool. Okay. Somebody shoots my sword, and I don't see it. Like, I've got my sword over here, and I'm fighting somebody, I've got my other sword back here, and you shoot the sword, and I don't notice it. What happens? Uh, you try to call out to the person, again, follow the same thing that I said before, you have to still have clear vision on the entire flight of the arrow to be able to call your shot. Um, if it qualifies for calling the shot, you call out to the person saying, hey, that hit you. If they still don't hear you, wave to a herald. Because then it is the herald's responsibility to ensure that the rule is still being held, and if the herald says that it doesn't have to, then it doesn't have to, but... Ultimately, you don't want to endanger yourself by running into melee, so... <laughs> Any other questions regarding that case? Okay, uh, next we're going to move into the actual process of shooting an arrow. Um, so, you know, step one, do a quick check on your arrow. I encourage every single archer who is here, who has now gone through the basics to look for for an arrow, every time you shoot an arrow, especially if you pick it up off the ground, to do a quick look to make sure it is actually safe, especially in locations where, say, there's a lot of pine needles on the ground, or if there's some puddles that are still left from rain a couple days ago, anything like that. Do a quick look, just because archers get a lot of bad rap for shooting arrows that have stuff on them still, because there are a lot of stupid archers who don't check their arrows. So, step one, look at your arrow. Make sure it's actually still legal to use. Right? Step two, for those who are new and therefore getting used to things, we're going to use what is called the table method. You're going to turn your bow sideways with your arm on top of it so that it looks like a table. You're going to take your arrow. In my case, I have three fletchings on here with one of the fletchings being different to make it easier to do this next step, which is you want one feather sticking up away from the bow, and then you're going to take the knock, and it will snap onto the string. You may not necessarily hear the snap, especially if the knock is a bit wider than the string itself, but overall you want it to actually be on and around the string so that it stays in place well enough. In the case of where it should sit on here, you may have an arrow rest, you may have a spot for your hand to hold it. Uh, in this case, the riser has these divots that kind of stick out, so the arrow can sit here. For the next step, you'll notice these three plastic spots here for your fingers. One finger is going to go above the arrow, two fingers will go below it. You look at your target, pull back until you reach the draw stop. Again, we're assuming full draw. I don't actually have a target over there to use as an example, uh, but you know, pull it back until the draw stop. You're about to. <laughs> when you're aiming, and when you're ready, you can let go of the string to let the arrow go. I have a target. <laughs> Take that leg, you slumber. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so that is the outline of taking an individual shot, or what I will be instructing you on today. Any questions on that? Yes.
short arrows that are left on the field, you want to also check them to make sure the head is not waterlogged, correct? Yes, yes. So an arrow is not, usually they'll ground the arrows if it's raining, mm -hmm. just in general. Um, but if there are puddles left on, say, a practice day, um, or if it had been raining but it's not raining anymore, they may allow arrows out without checking them regularly. Um, general rule of thumb is if the head has started absorbing water, it cannot be used on the field anymore. Am I allowed to use other archers' arrows? Yes, um, but it is generally considered a bad practice to walk around with the arrow. It's okay if you pick it up and you're like kind of pacing around while you look at your next target to hit, uh, but what they don't want is, you know, pick up 30 different people's arrows and drag them to where the line is in the field. Though you can do things like toss the arrows away from the line in order to make sure they aren't stepped on as much. If, if I may, culturally speaking, what you'll see at events is exactly what you described with the throw arrows back make like a pile-ish and then the archer will come up to the pile-ish and draw the other person's arrow and fire it back. Yes, and I originally had a dozen arrows and even then I would still run out of them after about five to ten minutes into the fight and then I had to go running around taking up other people's arrows because I was, didn't have any left in my quiver. <clears throat> yes. Aiming? How do you aim? Or is that a later question? Uh, that will depend on the person and experience and so many different things. Uh, what I'll be doing is um, basically using your arrowhead as a sight is what I'm going to be instructing you on. Um, most people honestly do instinctive because you are not allowed to have a physical sight on your bow. Um, but if you watch like Olympics, they have sights on their bows, it's a little different. Less of a question, more of a continuation of an answer. Um, every weapon is going to function differently. You're going to want to get a feel for it, dial it in, get comfortable with it, and then from there go at your own pace where you're comfortable and acquiring targets for it. Who's an ideal target for an archer? Coming to a battlefield, they see five people in front of them. Who's the first person they should aim at? Fucking me! <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the biggest the weapon archer. that doesn't have a shield, um, honestly. Typically not other archers, because they're your return policy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know. Unless all their arrows are already on the field. Okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> no, but even then, you yeah. want them to come back, and they will come yeah. back to you faster. <laughs> if they're like that. That being said, if there is a skilled archer who knows what they're doing, you may take them out, so that will not necessarily be so much tip. Um, but honestly, it is going to very much depend on the scenario. But the rule of thumb that I follow is, whichever weapon is standing out the most of the time, I try to aim at other soldiers. <laughs> start into actually using the bows now. Woo! Yeah, so yeah, thank yeah. you for putting up with my lecture. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mortem. Thank you. It was a great lecture. Really, really appreciate it. How many credits does this work? <laughs> <laughs> Did I pass? Is there extra credit? Oh, oh, no, no. The, the test is next week. Oh, <laughs> no. I did not. <laughs> I remember my question. Yes. Does dominant hand or eyes matter? That will come up more in the instructive bit. Okay. Honestly, it varies by person tremendously. Um, for those who do not know, just as you have a dominant hand, you also have a dominant eye. In particular, your brain kind of uses one eye more than the other. You don't um, have a dominant hand? Or sometimes it doesn't. In the same way that you can have people who are ambidextrous, you can also have people who are what is called co-dominant, where their <laughs> eyes are used close to the same amount, if not the exact same amount. Um, Generally speaking, when you're using any form of, uh, we'll say firearm, but also for bows and arrows, even though they don't use fire to shoot them, um, if you're using them at any amount of higher level, they will tell you to use your dominant eye. So that is the recommended starting point. That being said, for some people, if you're going to be running around all day using a bow and arrow, and you're not really going to be taking the time to aim with an individual's eye, you may very well decide that it is easier for you to shoot for longer periods of time with your dominant hand and get yourself used to using a non-dominant eye. So it is very much a preference. Um, at a higher level, the answer is dominant eye. At this level, it's up to the indiv individual. Yeah. Cool. That being said, I have also seen people even at a higher level train their eyes to switch their eyes. Wow. Really? So, yes. See? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. And in my case, I'm weird, where I'm normally primarily right 
right eye dominant, but I have co-dominance, and as I get tired, my left eye becomes dominant. So. <laughs> Thank you, Morna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll start the, uh, we'll start the actual Will this be on the test? Will that be on the test? <laughs> Maybe. Yes. Um. <laughs>